So good evening and welcome to the American Association of Dental Editors and Journalists webinar, Archiving Your Publication, Expanding Circulation and Promoting Content and Authors Through ADA Commons. The American Association of Dental Editors and Journalists section of the American College of Dentists promotes excellence, ethics, and leadership in dental journalism and communication. Through education, collaboration, and advocacy, the AADEJ section empowers dental editors, writers, and communication professionals to catalyze, po catalyze positive change and innovation across the dental community. We thank the American College of Dentists for hosting tonight's webinar. The ACD's Susan Pittman will be taking role at the beginning and end of the presentation. Those in attendance will receive one CEU awarded by ACD, sent to you by email in the next 10 days. Now I ask each of you to turn off your microphone and your camera. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat feature and we will address them after the presentation. This evening's speaker is Allison DeCock, a dental archivist and publishing librarian at the American Dental Association's Library and Archives. Allison earned a master's degree of library and information science from the University of Illinois. She's recognized as an expert in solo librarian leadership, archives, and digital asset management. She caters to clinicians, researchers, and academics. She's a former president of the Illinois chapter of the Special Libraries Association. Through her involvement in launching and managing ADA Commons, she is committed to preserving, organizing, and enhancing access to digital materials, ensuring that our profession's literature is searchable and discoverable in today's rapidly evolving digital landscape. Let's welcome Allison for our evening's presentation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Susan, for all of your efforts, and thank you for hosting me. I'm really excited to be here to speak with you about ADA Commons. I am going to share my screen. I've got a presentation for you, so I picked the wrong screen, <laughs> of course. Where is it? Okay, here we go. Um, all right, let's get going here. Hopefully everyone is seeing that. Holler if you're not. Um, so again, thank you all for being with me here today. I'm really, um, really appreciate you taking your time to learn more about ADA Commons. Um, we're gonna look at the site today. We're gonna go through some of the history of where ADA Commons kind of came from, um, the, sort of how it became um, a, a, a member service here at ADA. Um, we're really gonna look at how it can support the work you do as dental editors and journalists, how it can support your authors, all of that. Um, and then we're gonna look at what the process is to join. So if you're interested in joining, um, we're gonna kind of show you how that works. Um, and then I've also got contact information here in the site here that you can check out. Um, and I have a slide at the end too. So if you don't capture it here, you can capture it later. Um, moderators, feel free to interrupt if anything goes astray with technology. Um, if suddenly we lose power, um the storm comes through and everything shuts down let me know um okay so let's get started here so a little background about um ada commons so i really like to make sure that folks know this was a member driven project so this isn't something that came out of um the staff at ada the library the leadership here um um at the at the at headquarters, it actually came from the membership. So this was um, introduced to the House of Delegates in 2021 as Resolution ADH. Um, and that resolution actually asked ADA agencies to 
explore or creating or facilitating a searchable digital archive for the tripartite publications. Um, and so what happened was they took a year um, looked into what the needs were, you know, why membership wanted this, what was lacking, um, what they were hoping for, big dreams, all of that, and then brought that back um, to the House of Delegates in 2022, um, where that came up as resolution for 11 each, which was passed for the electronic archiving of state and component dental publications. Um, now, again, the reason I'm telling you this is just to emphasize that this was something that members wanted. Um, and it really was a member driven, driven program, which um, for librarians, we're always thrilled about that. We want to be able to give people what they want and not try to assume what anybody needs. So um, so we love that that came out of the membership. Um, so that's sort of the brief history of ADA Commons. Um, as I mentioned, there was some, we, we went out and listened to what people's needs were, um, why this you know came up in the first place. And there was a pretty broad um, variety of things that um, folks were looking for. Um, and th these are coming from, you know, the executive directors who um, I wasn't here at the time, but I assume we're talking to their editors and, and their members to, to see what was missing, right? And so a big one was simply that discoverability, right? Every, all of the state and local um, associations are publishing this great information. And it may be that peer reviewed science, scientific information, but it's also the experiential stuff that's happening in practices every day. Um, and not only making that more findable for your membership, but also being able to share that with other local groups, with other states, um, finding out what are, what are the issues that are facing people in other states. Maybe something going on in Idaho is relevant to somebody in Ohio, but they're not connected. There's no way for folks to be able to go in and, and search one place to get all this, um, especially the way publishing tools work. They're not always um, indexed by Google. They're not always, you can't find a single article in a flip book version of a PDF through Google, things like that. So looking to be more discoverable, also looking for that archiving feature, being able, we've got groups that their publications are spanning 160 years, but and they've they've scanned them, they've they've digitized them, but they're sitting on hard drives. So that doesn't do anybody any good, and it's not a good archiving method. We all know hard drives can crash. Um, so that was another need, being able to to archive these materials. Um, people were looking for publishing to support um, using DOIs, being able to assign these digital object identifiers is what DOIs are. You probably know that, but um, being able to assign DOIs to articles to make, give them that persistent access that especially authors like to see, how to increase submissions, um, looking to share um, across, across borders, across state lines, um, especially maybe you're producing a, um, a special issue that's really digging into one topic. Well, somebody else may have already written something relevant to that. And hey, could you reprint that from them? Could you give them more exposure and just and, and really improve that special issue? So um, those were kind of a, a variety of things that we were, we were hearing from folks. Um, and so what happened was then we came back and looked, okay, what tools solve for these things? What offer um, solutions for for what you all are looking for, what the membership's looking for? So one of them is a, a digital journal publishing platform. So there's a, different ones out there, but these really reach this list of um, needs, right? One is to be able to take author submissions online and actually do peer review all through all online. Um, so being able to get your reviewers um, all connected and, and respond all within one system. That was one. Metadata is a big one. So um, being able to assign specific keywords, specific titles to the individual articles in your issue, or at least the key articles that you want to be able to highlight, using metadata really increases its discoverability through um, search engines like Google, like DuckDuckGo, like Google Scholar, those kind of things. So um, being able to add metadata was important. Being able to kind of replicate what um, your print or your digital 
um, publication looks like through that table of contents and featured sections, things like that. Um, being able, allowing authors to have a direct link to their individual issue um, is one. Again, DOIs, like I mentioned, um, and just being able to be included in other databases. So that's something that digital journal publishing platforms offer, but that doesn't meet all of the requirements. And so the other type of system that meets some of those requirements is a repository or an institutional repository. Um, these are very common across universities. You have probably heard of them. Um, they're often used for um, students to add their um, dissertations or thesis, whatever their final kind of master's project is, but as, as well as um, the professors at universities, a place for them to um, deposit their works, if they're, if, you know, scientific research articles that have been published. And so that's something else that we knew would be, uh, a, that would solve for some of these needs, um, allowing for the ADA to create that central source where everybody could um, archive and publish their um, um, their materials. It allows for searchability across the repository, as well as increasing the ability to be found in those um, um, search engines like Google, increasing discoverability as well. Um, one of another, like, using open access and increasing um, the, the reach of your publications by removing them from that member paywall, paywall, which I will talk more about because making thing, having your publication as a member benefits also very important. So it's kind of a fine line there that we can, we work with you on. Um, but then just in general, increasing readership that every advertiser wants to know that they're being seen in your publication. Your authors want to know that they're being read. And of course you want to know that um, the, the thing you work so hard on every month or every other month is getting out there and being seen. And then finally, of course, that archiving piece of it, finding a repository that we can trust will um, safely house this material for the long haul. And that, is, is there's a lot of backup servers. So we took all of that in those two kinds of software tools that, that could fill those goals. And we landed on something called Digital Commons. Now, Digital Commons is, um, it was started at Berkeley Press at Berkeley um, about 20 years ago. It's been around for about 20 years. And it really is, it was designed to be an institutional repository for student and um, papers authored by um, staff and professors. But what they quickly realized was that was gonna spread across that everybody was looking for something like that. And so it's become very widely used across academic organizations, um, across the world actually, although it's, it's heavily used in North America. There are people across the country that use this as their, or the world that use this as their repository. And it's not just academic institutions anymore. Um, it's very commonly used in um, medical facilities for their institutional repository or IR, I will call it to save myself all of those syllables. Um, but, and then it's also used by associations like ADA. So it's not just limited to that one field of academia, um, but many, many folks are using this now. It has that open access um, that many folks are looking for, but it also allows for some access control options where you can limit um, either by email or you can set an embargo for your work, for your um, issues. So as to kind of retain some of that member benefit that people are looking for. Um, it's indexed by all the big search engines, which is another important thing to be findable. You need to be indexed um, by Google Scholar and Google and all those. Um, another key one we liked is that you can customize the site. So you'll see this later. I'm going to explore the actual website, ADA Commons, pretty soon. Um, and you can see the um, some examples of that. But that was a really important one because we want to give you the ability to design a site that fits in with what your brand is. You know, what's the color palette you use? Where are your logos? And having some flexibility there. Another big one is metrics. You can kind of see a little glimpse of it in this image, but you can um, track 
the countries that are reading um, your materials. You can narrow it all the way down to the individual articles, see how often it's been download, downloaded over a specific window of time. Um, it's got some really great tools there for metrics. And then finally, it uses something called clocks, <laughs> which is basically lots of copies keep stuff, stuff safe. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. Hard to say, um, but that it, that system basically uses 12 different servers across certainly the country, if not larger than that. So if one goes down, you're not losing any data. So um, that's a that's been a standard for digital archiving for a few decades now. Um, and so we liked that about Digital Commons that it was using a very established archiving system. Okay, so what does that look like? What hap What we ended up doing in the summer of last year, um, the team here at ADA, um, which is made up of three different librarians, got together and started working like crazy to build out the new ADA Commons. So this site was designed specifically for housing your publications, as well as we're building out, we're actually building out now a scholarship piece of it that will allow for individuals to upload their scholarly works. So say you're publishing something that's not a um, state or local publication, which why would you ever do that? But hey, sometimes people want to publish in JADA or other medical um, journals. And so this would give them the opportunity to, to deposit their materials in a rep repository, um, giving them that persistent access, um, which if you're not affiliated with the university that has an IR, that's not an option for some people. So so we're, so we're, we've got some scholarly information. We're also adding some information from um, the ADA archives here. So we really, the goal is that this is gonna be that central repository for all things dental, um, and that it will become the place that um, dental students and researchers go um, to, to find that research that they're looking for. So that's what this site looks like. Again, um, we're going to dig in in a couple more slides to see what um, this, this um, your site can look like, some examples from Michigan and New York, and how they can be customized. But it really, ADA Commons really hits all of those needs from um, that we heard from the membership. And then one final point on this page that is one of our biggest questions is how much does it cost? and it doesn't cost anything for the ADA tripartite membership. So if you're a state or a local um, publication, you publish to this for free. Um, it's no cost to publish to it. It's no cost to archive it. There's no limit to how much you can add to it. So again, we've talked to folks that have 160 years worth of um, publications that they wanna be able to add. Um, and there are two of us here at ADA, myself and my, um, um, my coworker, Ellen, Ellen Thiem, um, and we help every step of the way with this. So we don't just throw this at you and say, go have fun. <laughs> We're here to walk you through every step of the process, as well as helping you manage the publication, the ongoing publication. Um, so I can, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but the idea is that we we are really here to help support you with this and take as much off your plate um, as you need because I know everybody's swamped all the time. So that's what we're here to do. Um, so what can you put on EDA Commons? Obviously I'm talking about publications a lot like journals, newsletters, bulletins. Um, those are the things we're, we're working with the most right now with the different state and local groups um, that we're talking to, but you can also, um, collect webinars there. So if you're doing continuing education um, in your state or local group, and you would like to be able to post those webinars after the fact, you can store them here. Um, and what's nice about that, and for a lot of this is, well, yes, you can put this on your website, that you reach a point where you can't just keep adding to your website. There's it, there's space issues, there's cost issues of that. Um, so maybe being able to take the older stuff and moving them over into ADA Commons um, is, a, is a space and money saving option for you. 
conference materials is a big one. Um, we've talked to folks that would like to host their conference information there. You can add your schedules, you can add posters, you can add the, the slide decks of presentations, you can add the recordings of presentations, and then keep that on an annual basis. So if you're if you have an annual conference, this might be a place where you can not only host that conference, but but archive the older years. Because um, very often people remember going to, a, I went to a conference 10 years ago and what was that session I went to? Who was that speaker? And how amazing would it be to be able to actually quickly find that out um, through ADA Commons. But other, uh, clearly we can, ADA Commons will host just about any format, um, whether it's videos or images. Um, if you have parties at the end of the year or a summer gathering and you would like to be able to put those photos up somewhere, we can create galleries on ADA Commons for that too. So lots and lots of options. Um, and then one last page before we check out the website, actually. Um, we're going to look at the website a little bit, and then we'll come back and talk about how you participate. Um, but this is one example of what that customized page looks like, what the site for that specific publication looks like. This is Journal of Michigan Dental Association. Thank you, Dr. Smiley. Um, <laughs> Michigan was the first group that we got up and really um, was an excellent guinea pig as we were learning some lessons through the design process. But you can see here, you can customize your color, you can add your logos, you can customize the links on the side. There are some aspects of it that are sort of locked in place because that's how um, the overall system needs to operate. But there's still some flexibility there for you to make it look like your own. Um, so I'm going to escape out of here and go look at the website. So hopefully everyone is seeing um, ADA Commons website now. If you're not, please holler. I'll give you a second to holler while I take a glass, a uh, sip of water. <laughs> okay, I think we're good. So this is the landing page for ADA Commons. So this is that homepage. If you just type in commons.ada.org, this is where you land. Um, you can see here, this is the section that houses the state and local dental publications. This is the scholarship section I talked about. And then we've got some archival materials as well. Um, one thing I want to note before we start looking at um, what the publications look like, I want to note this authors section, because this is a really nice um, thing you can promote to your authors, is this ability of any, when your authors, if your authors publish and we upload it to ADA Commons, um, and we have the author information, they will be featured in this list. So I'm going to jump to Dr. Smiley because he's published a bit from when he was editor of the Michigan Journal. But you can go and find your name. And th then if the site loads up, there we go. Um, you can see everything that we've uploaded from the Michigan Journal that um, Dr. Smiley has written. So this is just a great feature for authors to be able to go in and say, oh, what of my, what of mine? did get in here. And then eventually, when we open that scholarly repository, because Chris has also written other things outside of the Michigan Journal, we can add that content as well. And this can become kind of the a single source for him to be able to see everything he's written um, that's been uploaded to ADA Commons. That's the one caveat about the site, and there has been confusion about that. This only shows what we've added. It's not an aggregator from other places. So if the journal isn't part of ADA Commons, then you won't see your article there yet. Um, but hopefully that will just be more impetus to join Commons. Um, so that's the author option. Um, if you scroll down this, you see the mission, you see some other information, ways you can you can kind of find fun things, the top 10 downloads. And then there's also this pinned map at the bottom. This just kind of drops pins in where people have just recently downloaded something. So you can see it, it's, it ends up being all over the place. This really has some global impact. Um, folks, are, folks from around the world are reading materials um, on ADA comments, which is really exciting. Um, and one thing I will note 
the um, this really only officially launched in October. Um, the site was up and running before that, but um, we officially la launched it at SmileCon. And we've now had over 14,000 downloads just in that five to six month period, um, which is from 121 countries. So it's really the reach of it without doing a whole lot of marketing, globally at least, um, people know about uh, digital commons um, and are finding us um, pretty amazingly through just Google searches um, and some other tools that I'll show you. So that's that's really exciting for us to see the kind of reach that this information is having. All right, so we're going to look at those, the state and local dental publications. This is just the site that's going to organize it. This is probably most people, most of your readers are never going to come to this page. Um, most likely you're going to link directly to the site. You're not going to link to this site. Why would you? Um, but this is just helps us keep everything organized. Um, we this I need to update this. We have some more publications coming soon. Um, this section, I just haven't updated it lately. lately. So we've got quite a few more people we're in talks with. Um, OK, so let's look at Michigan's first. So we're back. You've seen this already. Um, this is what the site looks like live. You've got your logo at the top. You've got the color scheme you want. Um, the, the On this main home page here, oh, I'm just seeing a little glitch. We've got a period and an uh, exclamation point. I got to fix that. I better make a note. <laughs> um, this has a little, just the blurb, the basic blurb about um, the journal. There's more information over here in the quick link section. Um, but the key thing that we want people to see right away is that this is the most recent issue. This is the March issue. April is coming out in a week. Um, you see uh, this abstract, which is the abstract for the whole issue giving people information, what are the articles, um, just a, a quick glimpse at what that is. Um, this is a live link, so it's not just an image of the cover art, it's also a clickable link that allows you to download the full issue. But if you scroll down, you also see a link here to the full issue and then broken out articles. Usually, um, the articles that are broken out are kind of the key, the big ones, um, your, your feature articles, your scientific research, maybe if you have a, a monthly message from the president, whatever those are, those are kind of what gets broken out. Um, it can be five articles, it can be 15 articles, it just depends on the nature of your publication. Um, so let me, I'm gonna click, let's see. So I'll, I'll first look, show you what the full issue page looks like. So when you click on that link, you come to another page that again has the abstract and it gives you the link to download. So we don't force people to download things right away. We give them a chance to look, um, to learn a little bit more about that. Um, it's less important for the full text version, but it is important for the individual articles. Um, people who are doing research are quite used to reading the abstract first before they decide if they want to download the whole article or start the whole article. So um, that's an important feature of this, which I'll show you in a second. But from here, you can download that. You can also see some metrics about it, which is fun. You can see the number of downloads here um, and then your Plumex metrics as well. Um, there's sometimes a little, yeah, there's sometimes a little difference between Plumax and downloads there. This is an external tool, um, which is nice because it also shows some social media and other metrics, but it's always like a little bit behind. And that's that's the line that I've gotten from Digital Commons. So, um, but this is the more accurate number of 89 downloads. So in the past month, they've gotten, this full issue has been downloaded 89 times. And this information is available for any user to see, including your authors, which is nice. But then I'll show you in a minute, the more ro robust uh, metrics that you can see as, a, as an administrator of the site. So that's what, um, so, Sorry, I should have. So if you click on the download, then that brings you to this. Ooh, it's so tiny. Sorry. Um, so every um, article or full text issue that is um, uploaded receives a cover letter because that allows, if anyone comes to your site from like Google or Google Scholar or comes to the article directly, 
they'll come to this. They won't come to actually the full site necessarily, especially if they're using Google Scholar. Um, so it's important to have this because these are all live links that will bring them back to the website. So that's why that cover letter is there. And then you've got the full text issue here, just standard. All right, so that's what that the full text looks like. You can also click um, on the individual article. Again, you've got that abstract um, and you've got the download link. Um, this is a different one, but again, you see it, the same thing, there's that cover letter. Um, the citation is there. That's also can be very helpful for folks. Um, one other thing you'll see on the side here are all of these words <laughs> and phrases. So these are called disciplines. These are actually managed by Digital Commons um, because they aggregate everyone who uses Digital Commons. What they're uploading is actually aggregated into the Digital Commons network. Um, and when you tag things with these disciplines, they get featured in that specific sub-collection of Digital Commons Network. So a lot of the work that's being added into um, ADA Commons goes into Dentistry Commons, which is just a, another fabulous resource of, the, of dental research that's out there. And this is pulling stuff from, from all repositories anywhere that choose to tag with one of those dental um, sub-disciplines. So you can see there's about 9,000 full text articles in there. Um, we are responsible for quite a few of those um, in a growing way. So ADA has actually had a really nice, healthy impact on this collection. And in fact, um, Ellen, my coworker, just submitted five new disciplines um, and what they were accepted to expand the kinds of sub-disciplines we have here. Um, so just we're bringing that knowledge, that dental knowledge and experience to, um, to the people that run this system. And that's just really exciting for us. Okay, so that's what Michigan's look like. Um, oh, one thing I didn't show you, I'm sorry, I forgot. We also have the links on the side. These are all customizable as well. There's a few that are recommended that we usually always include, but you've got your about, you have your aims and your scope, which tells more about um, the journal. A couple of key ones, a really key one is this author guidelines. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that peer review submission process, but um, you can accept articles through ADA Commons. We do recommend that you have author guidelines um, and making them available here because it really allows you, if you do have to turn somebody down or ask for revisions, you can always refer back to those guidelines, right? I don't need to tell you about the importance of author guidelines, but um, you can you can link to those here, um, either back to your website or we can upload a PDF or add it in as HTML text. It really doesn't matter. But all of this is pretty flexible. And so depending on what you already have or what you want to make um, people aware of, we can build these links on the side. And then of course, if people know a specific issue they want, you can scroll through all of the options here. Michigan's got about five years up. Um, so there's quite a bit here. You can browse that way. You can also search um, and you can search within this specific journal. You can search within our entire ADA repository or across all repositories. So lots of great searchable, flexible ways to, to get that information. All right, um, I'm just gonna show you New York's quickly so you can see um, the, the variation. They, they chose sort of a similar layout, um, but obviously different, different logo, different color scheme, that sort of thing. Um, another, this is just a side note, this isn't even really related to ADA Commons, but New York just updated their author guidelines. So I wanted to show you, um, they actually added a whole section on AI um, and authorship using AI. And I know that's of a concern and of interest to this group specifically. So just wanted to point it out, if you wanna see an example um, of, of what one of your, your peer um, associations is doing, uh, New York's got a great example here. Um, some other groups uh, or associations and publications in general will, will refer back to the um, COPE guidelines, the Committee on Publication Ethics, and just say we follow the COPE rules, um, but New York actually wrote some out themselves. Let's see. So I think that is everything. 
Um, I'm trying to keep an eye on the time here because I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end. Um, so I'm going to go back. Oops, I did that wrong. Oh, well, we can just fly through really quickly. Um, so I want to go back to my PowerPoint to talk about what do you do now? What does it look like to actually participate in in ADA Commons? How do you join? What's the process? All of that. So the way we have it set up is we've got these five phases. Um, kickoff, which you're actually jumping, um, jumping the line here by participating in this session, because a lot of what we talk about at kickoff, I'm talking to you about today. But um, one of the things we do at, at kickoff is we really talk to you about what your needs are. Um, what does your publication look like? Do you have conferences? Do you have images? You know, what are all of the different options um, that you would like to take advantage of? And then what are maybe some of the restrictions? Do you do you want to embargo uh, a certain amount of number of your issues for a year or two years? Um, do you use a flip book? Like what are the, what kind of links do you have? What, what are those needs and how can we at ADA help you um, kind of solve for those? So that's the kickoff phase. Um, you're seeing here three examples that I just recently did. Um, I don't do the designing. Let me just make that clear. The folks, the professionals <laughs> at Digital Commons do the designing um, of a mock of mockups as well as your site. But um, what we found is sometimes the design phase, which is the next phase, can be a little intimidating. Um, some folks have designers on staff, so that helps, but sometimes you don't. Like it, everybody's a little bit different. So I've started sort of mocking up just some really rough versions. So that's what you're seeing here. This is not SDDS's website by any means. So don't don't assume that it is. It's just some examples of of how we can kind of help you look at things a little bit different, um, place things different, use different colors, that sort of thing. So that's all part of the design process. Um, there's a form that you have to fill out that we can walk you through that helps um, clarify some of the back end processes. Um, and then there's a um, a Photoshop form, a template that we give you that you can use to actually design your site out just to give the folks at Digital Commons a really solid starting point. Um, but we really work together with you on that. We can, we can help you with a lot of that process too. Um, so once that's done, that goes back to the designers at Digital Commons. They will do up to three iterations of your site. Um, just um, images, they'll send you PDFs of what that's what your site could look like. And we use those iterations to refine and make sure we get it just the way you want it. Once you get through that, then we move to Sandbox. So Sandbox is where the designers actually build a real live web website for you, but it's in a sandbox. It's not live to the public, and it's just a place for you to be able to practice and play. Um, so once we are in the sandbox, we do a training with you. We teach you how to use it. We teach you how everything operates. But we also talk to you about how much do you want to be responsible for and how much help do you need? Um, because here's the thing, again, I go back to, we know how busy you are. This is another thing that gets put on your plate. And Ellen and I are here to try to relieve some of that pressure. So right now, New York and Michigan, both, we publish for them. So they provide the materials, they provide um, the issue, and metadata for the issue in the articles. And then we take that, break it up and upload it to the system. We have another state who prefers to do it all themselves. Um, so we've trained them very thoroughly on the site. They're playing in the sandbox now. And then they, they will res be responsible for uploading all of their issues. But we're still, we're still here to help. We're still here to you know, advise, we're still here to give refreshers on how things work. Um, so no matter where you're coming from, Ellen and I are here to support that. All right, so once that sandbox is done, we go to launch, we launch the site, and from there on, it goes into publication. So if you wanna add a lot of back content, we can help support that. We can do a lot of that through batch uploading. Um, but once the site's launched, then it just enters into sort of monthly or bi-monthly publication of, of your issue. So that's kind of how the project phases work. 
This is just a quick example. We can build you a customized metadata form. The metadata is really important. It helps us keep author information straight. Um, I showed you that list of authors. If we don't get the same email every time, or if there's author name changes, then we can end up with multiple um, of the same person in the system and, and nobody wants that. So um, we do ask you to provide some of that information um, for us because you know better than we do, um, but we can build you, we build you this form specifically tailored to what your, what, how your site is built basically. Um, quickly, cause I am, I wanna make sure we have time for questions and I'm talking too much. Um, this is a quick look at kind of how authors can submit articles. Um, this is a great feature. I know for a lot of folks that have peer review um, content in their journals, um, this allows you to have another another way, another access point, if I'm going to speak library, librarian talk, um, another access point for your authors to be able to submit to you and maybe new reach for new authors. There's a lot of pluses and pros to that. Um, as a secondary index tool, as a system that many authors know, um, it also can increase your unsolicited articles, which is a pro and maybe a con too. Um, you may have to spend more time double checking who the people are that are submitting. You may not know them. Um, so it may change your process a little bit. So it's something we talked to you about. And do you want to use the full peer review process? Or do you just want to be able to submit art or accept articles through the site and then push it through your established peer review process? People use different methods. It's completely up to you. We talked a little bit about metrics. Oh, wait. I didn't show you the metrics page, did I? I forgot, I'm sorry, I ran out of time. Um, this is an example of the metrics that you can have access to. Um, I was gonna dig into it a little bit more on the site, but I think we're running short on time, so I'll just talk about it here instead. Um, you actually can see a, a page like this for the entire globe, and then you can zone it, you can zoom in on each of those little dots there, um, and it'll show you exactly where people are downloading materials from. Um, so it's really fun to be able to see that for your publication. Um, you won't have access to all of the metrics. You only have access to the metrics for your publication, but um, you can see where people are reading at, how many downloads there are. Um, there's there's um, bar charts for over the course of whatever time frame you want. Um, you can get pretty nice and specific, which um, I, I go down rabbit holes of this of like, maybe I should show you. I'm I'm going to show you because it's just it's kind of a cool thing. <laughs> so I should have showed you this before. Um, so this is the dashboard. And so you can kind of see it on a big, but like if I just pick Hawaii, I can get all the way in and see exactly where people are downloading stuff in Hawaii. So these, this is all on Honolulu, um, but I just think it's so crazy. Like up here in Russia, this there's like some small, small little town in northeastern Russia is reading stuff off of Digital Commons. It's just sort of amazing to me, and I love I love being able to see that. Um, but as I said, you can get all sorts of different stats here. Um, this is. This is our downloads. It's really, it's just showing downloads, um, but you can see how many downloads we've had. Um, you can see how much, how many works have been posted. Um, you can see the countries, who's, you know, who's reading what, where. There's just a, a nice amount of, of um, data that's available to you through, through the site. Um, and again, the Plumex metrics that I showed you, that's visible to your readership. So this information you're seeing here, this is only re um, viewable to you as an administrator, but those Plumex metrics that we saw affiliated with direct articles, um, are those are visible to your readership, including your authors. And authors love to see that they're being read, right? Like That's why they're writing. They wanna know that they're being read. Um, and then our global reach, as I mentioned before, you know, we launched this in October and we've already hit 121 countries. And actually this is the number from yesterday. It could have gone up since. Um, at some point we're gonna max out, <laughs> I think 195 countries, however many there are exactly. Um, 
but it's just fun to see every week I report these stats um, back to, to my team here. And it's like last week, it's like Uganda has downloaded something. And um, it's just, it's just wild to see um, how many folks are, are getting access to this information because it's really, they wouldn't otherwise, they'd never be able to find it. Who's, you know, somebody in Pakistan is, is looking for an article on oral lesions, which was our most downloaded item for a long time. Um, that was from the Michigan journal. It was an article about or a scientific article about oral lesions and people were downloading it all over the world. That would have not, they don't, they don't know Michigan's publishing information about that, but hopefully that helped someone somewhere. So um, it's thrilling to me as somebody who really wants to disseminate this kind of information to see that really happening kind of in real time. Okay, so questions. Um, I have a list of questions here that we get asked commonly that um, I just figured I'd just address now, but then definitely we'll have time if I talk really fast um, for, for more questions after. Um, actually, and I'll ask Susan, do we have any questions now so that I don't, so I can talk faster or slower? <laughs> Actually, there are no questions in the chat at this time. Oh, great. Okay. So then I don't have to rush. Um, I am going to take another drink of water quick. Okay. So one of the things we get a lot is who else is participating. So right now we have um, Michigan and New York are in there. We have a, the state of Virginia in the sandbox Um they're training right now on the site. And then we also have um, Metro Denver, which is a local group. That's it's all about to go into the sandbox now, um, but we have had we are in the middle of conversations or the design phase with seven other states and four other local associations. So um, we're kind of because it's it's a very manual process adding a lot of this information and the design phase and all of that. It's it's kind of nice. We're sort of staggering as people are are adding, um, and honestly, the the timeline for the process. It can be done in two months or it can take six months. It's important for you to know that we work on your time frame. Um, obviously, I want everybody in now, right? <laughs> I'm excited about it. I want to see um, it continue to grow. But this is another thing on your plate. Um, and as much as I can say we can take a lot of the work off your plate, there's still decisions that um, you as editors, you need to work with your EDs um, and your team on. So um, it's important that, that we can work with your schedule. So we're never rushing you. It's really your timeline. So important to share that. Um, that members only, that member benefit question, we get a lot. We don't, we want to, this is a member benefit. We don't want to make it open access. And we like to clarify that open access is not required. There's flexibility within the system. You can set up an embargo so you're not publishing publicly for the first six months or 12 months or 18 months, whatever you want that to be. Um, or you can also set it up so that um, people have to log in um, with a recognizable email address that's associated with your group um, or your society, and that's how they can view the content. So there's some options there. We do like to encourage the open source aspect of it, even if it's, even after an embargo, um, it's the kind of thing that does, you can show your advertisers the amount of reach that each issue is getting or each article is getting. Authors love it, they, they wanna be read. So um, so there's a lot of benefits to being open access, but we also understand that balance between uh, preserving that member benefit for your your folks, um, but also making sure it's read and, and, and your publication is getting exposed to the world. Uh, the third question, if you want to remove anything later, all the content always remains yours. By uploading to ADA Commons, you are not losing your copyright. You are not transferring anything to ADA National. Um, it's all still yours. You can take it down anytime you want. We hope you never will, but if something changes and you want to, it's always yours. Uh, number four, we don't publish scientific peer review content. It doesn't matter. Here's the thing. What, what that experiential stuff that's happening um, across the country. It's not always about the, the scientific um, content that, that folks are publishing. It's also sharing the information of this is a thing that we're dealing with. 
this might help you, that knowledge sharing across state lines, across the, the local groups, that can be key. Um, that was actually something that came out of this was early on in 2020, the recognition that there was no real history of how dentistry approached the last pandemic. And there wasn't a lot of information out there. Not that a hundred year old information might've been super key, but it could have provided some insight to how to move forward with the practice during the pandemic. Um, and that's that experiential stuff. That's not always the scientific research that's being done. So um, we view that that kind of content as, as vital as anything else. Um, five and six, both uh, helping, again, being seen. Your advertisers, imagine if you could tell your advertiser they're not only being seen in Chicago, but they're being seen across Illinois, across the United States, and actually across the world. Not all advertisers care about worldwide recognition, but certainly having that larger um, audience is what advertiser doesn't want to be seen anywhere. Um, and the same thing with authors. They they wanna they wanna know that they're being read. Um, number seven, what does this cost? Again, it's free. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. It's if if you are a member of the ADA as a local or a state group, it's free for you. Um, we're actually hoping potentially to open it up um, uh, for a fee to other affiliate groups, but for you, the state and local groups, it is free. And then the last question we get is we just don't have time, which isn't really a question, but it is a very strong statement to make and we get it, we sympathize. Uh, and that's why Ellen and I are here. Again, we can't take everything off your plate, but we can take a lot of it. Um, and and that's and we, we are eager to talk to everybody about how we can help you with this. That's that's my goal here. Okay. Allison, yes. we, we do have a question Great. that is in the chat. Okay. Um, Dr. Kerry Carney of California mm -hmm. would like to have you talk a little bit about the indexing, I assume DOI, mm -hmm. uh, that you mentioned earlier and how commons can facilitate that. Sure. So it's kind of automatic within commons. DOI is a separate um, process, um, but commons actually are digital commons pays for DOI. So normally that is that is an additional fee that you have to pay for individually as a publication. ADA Commons has, or sorry, Digital Commons has taken that on as part of the annual fee that we pay them. So if DOI is something that you're interested in, um, that you have to have um, an electronic ISBN for your publication, which a lot of people have a print one but don't know you have to also have an electronic one. But as long as you have that electronic one, we can process that with um, Digital Commons and get you DOIs for those individual articles. So that's one tool. Um, a lot of the, the indexing sort of happens magically behind the scenes um, to, to you know process through the search engines that are out there. Um, so I can talk to you a little bit more about that um, maybe offline if we can dig into it a little bit more, but um, certainly that happens too. I'm not sure if that answers your question. But. And how do you go about getting the the electric? Um, it's the same way you get um, your your you got your print ISBN, um, mm -hmm. and I can't remember the site. I've got all this written down, um, but it's the same sort of process for getting a, a print ISBN is getting the electronic one. Um, there are some forms you have to fill out through um, through the organization and I apologize, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but um, it's the same process. You just, you just kind of have to re-register so that you get that specific electronic one. So and like again, everything with ADA Commons, you and the team will walk people through yes. that. Yes, and I have all that information. I have the website and, and the specific instructions on how to do that separate. So we have another question yes. uh, from Dr. Michael Mayhofer, who is questioning for smaller journals or newsletters. Mm -hmm. Is it required that you identify all the metadata, for example, multiple keywords, et cetera? Do you have to break out all the articles or can you just upload the entire PDF for a single issue? Um, you can upload the entire PDF. We do, 
the sys digital commons likes it when you break out a few articles um just to sort of highlight the, the fullness of the the issue um so what we usually recommend is moving forward you upload the full issue and maybe two or three key articles but any of your back issues you don't have to do that you can just upload the full text you don't have to break out everything going back 100 years by any means um and then the metadata can be pretty flexible too especially when you're talking about like president reports and things like that you might not have you know five keywords for that um you might not have any um, and that's okay with with the with the bulletins and the newsletters. They can be a little less robust, um, and we can talk to you about that too. Um, but it, you can kind of some things require more metadata, especially some of the journals, the peer reviewed stuff, just because that is scholarly um, record, scholarly information. But um, the newsletters we can be a little more re relaxed about. <laughs> that makes sense. All right, what else? I see no other questions in the chat box. So thank you, Allison. And I want to yes. thank everybody else for, for attending this evening's uh, AADEJ sections webinar. So I thank hope you, you so see... much. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank ahead. you so much, um, Chris. I just wanted to say thank you before because I'm going to flip this um, to the next slide for you. But um, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. If you want to know more, feel free to contact me at this email. Um, and I just appreciate everyone's time. So, okay. There you go, Chris. <laughs> well, great. And, and I mean, fantastic. Just because, I, you know, small or large publications you know we, we you get archived for free and you know allison mentioned that but i want to emphasize it this is all free and, and if you provide them with your pdf they will break it out for you you just provide the metadata um which is really the most essential part of it uh after you've established your design and anybody who's struggling with that you're welcome i mean a copying is a sign of flattery, I suppose. If you want to mimic the uh, the format of the Michigan Dental Association, bring it on. That is great. Um, so contact Allison at comments at ada.org if you have any questions. CE credits will be emailed to registrants by the American College of Dentists within the next 10 days. Our next program is the Can't Miss Dental Editors University, and that's going to be a live in-person event that's going to be held Thursday, May 2nd and Friday, May 3rd at the Rose in the Rosemont at the uh, Alaskan Institute of the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Sur Surgeons. After a five-year hiatus, the return of DEU provides opportunities for professional development with some fascinating presentations. Every dental leader can benefit from Dental Editors University to sharpen their skills and explore new technologies to motivate and deliver a trusted, valid message. Take a look at that QR code that's down there or go to our website, aadej.org forward slash D-E-U for Dental Editors University. And that will provide you with what you need to find out about our program, our wonderful speakers. We have over 10 speakers, right, uh, that are on many hot topics, uh, including artificial intelligence uh, in publishing and editing, in social media, in podcasting. We have a writer's workshop and so much more. So I hope you can come to Chicago and join us because it's going to be a great event. So thank you everybody for coming this evening and uh, thank you to ACD for hosting us. Thanks Chris for putting that together, being the MC.